Let me introduce Marion. Marion Hobbs was raised in Christchurch and educated at St. Dominic's College in Dunedin. Came back here then and attended the University of Canterbury where I first met her as, well, let me choose my words carefully, <laughs> as a passionate member of an energetic and politically oriented group of students, at least one other of whom became a cabinet minister. The passion has led her, her into two major areas, education and politics. She was a teacher through all levels of responsibility for 25 years, a former principal of Avonside Girls High School and an education advisor in the UK. Marion was also notable for her ability to walk the talk, in my opinion. I remember her work, for instance, as a prison visitor. Her political career spanned a period of 12 years holding several ministerial posts in the Labour government of Helen Clark, in, starting in 1999. Among other posts, she was Minister for the Environment, Minister for Disarmament and Arms, Minister of Broadcasting, and Associate Minister of Education. Marion is a Quaker and a mother of two children and currently resides in Dunedin with her partner, Richard. Marion. Thank you, David. So the topic is entitled, A Peaceful World, How Can We Make It So? By the way, looking at the hair in this room, if anyone can't hear, just scratch your nose and I'll do something about it. I don't know what I'll do, but never mind. I'll speak a bit more clearly. A peaceful world, how can we make it so, isn't too big a job for me or my friends. God, I keep on seeing faces of people I know. It's, it's a bit unnerving. So in this, which is a very much briefer version than the book, Auckland just about got the full book, and that took an hour and 30 minutes, and some people were asleep. <laughs> Dunedin, I got it down, and Christchurch, I'll get it down even further. But in this briefer version, I hope to persuade you all that working together for peace is both possible and effective. Peace will not happen unless each and every one of us consciously works for it. The same can be said about sustainability any of those values that we're talking about. But they won't happen just because a government decides it. In the United Kingdom, I was often asked, why did New Zealand become so strongly anti-nuclear? And I had two answers. The first was that other countries use the Pacific as their testing, testing ground, and we resented that unwelcome, uninvited intrusion into our backyard. And the second, which I'll develop again later, was that we worked on this issue at the neighbourhood level. Rather than policy being formed at central government and imposed upon people, it went the reverse way. And that meant that it's never really been able to be totally challenged. It's been nibbled at, it's being nibbled at at the moment, but it's never been totally challenged because it's something owned by the people. And I think you have to remember that when you're engaging in politics, which is much better if it's a small P and not a capital P. The New Zealand Nuclear Free Zone Disarmament and Arms Control Act is almost 30 years old. God, so that accounts for the here in this room. It was passed in 1987. We've become focused on other urgent issues, such as climate change. And disarmament has gone from our activity radar. Yet we live in a world of distressing violence. From violence in the home, to international acts of extreme violence, which we see on our screens. And just, I think I saw in the last 24 hours, chemical weapons yet again being used in Syria. 
Sometimes it just seems too much and we don't know how our work might fit into a network of actions to build peace. The public discourse is on terrorism and it's on fear and it's on retaliation. Well, I don't know about you, but I want to live my remaining years positively, not in fear. I don't, I don't buy that discourse. So this lecture, talk, whatever, and as usual, I'll take off, is an attempt to explore disarmament and the facts around that and peace building, but most importantly, how we might contribute effectively. So before I go into the arguments about disarmament, I want to explore the basis for peace building. So I went to the Quakers. In 1987, the New Zealand Society of Friends published a strong yearly meeting statement on peace. It's pinned up on the door there, the original one, and I think there are some other copies around. One sentence has always stood out for me. The primary reason for this stand is our conviction that there is that of God in everyone which makes each person too precious to damage or destroy. As David was saying, in Quakers, that God can cover all sorts of shapes and sizes and kinds. But there, I often say there is a goodness, ultimate goodness in everyone. Whatever. Makes each person too precious to damage or destroy. That sentence alone has always provided me with the reason to work for peace. The yearly meeting statement, by the way, has wonderful sentences in it, and I'll quote quite a few of them. So thread one of my three threads is each person on earth is too precious to damage or destroy. And that includes the president of North Korea. Okay? In 1921, and here's a second thread, A. Neve Brayshaw wrote, and it's 1921, and it's his language. The Quaker testimony concerning war is based ultimately on the conception of that of God in every man, to which the Christian in the presence of evil is called on to make appeal, following out a line of thought and conduct, which involving suffering as it may do, is in the long run the most likely to reach to the inward witness and so change the evil mind into the right mind. The result is not achieved by war. Let me try and translate this for me, because it's not my language, that. But the thoughts, the ideas are. This aspect of reaching to the inward witness has underpinned my work in education as much as in peace. It is just as applicable to a tutor in the prison cell as much as to a teacher in the classroom. And recently I've been doing some tutoring uh, back in um, Milton. The challenge is so much following out a line of thought and conduct which will result in change. Now, we're not going to achieve peace. I know actually it's really cathartic sometimes by marching and shouting slogans. That won't achieve peace. It's good fun, but it won't <laughs> achieve it. We need to engage thoughtfully with those who seek to harm us or others, and to do this by the right means, never by war and never by imposed state force. The 1987 Yeni Meeting Peace Statement, while someone lives, there is always a hope of reaching that of God in everyone, which makes each person too precious to damage and destroy. So the second thread, is to challenge evil and to build peace, we must connect with the goodness in each human being. You don't wipe the human beings out because there's goodness and you connect with that goodness. Third one, in 1952, we're getting closer, the following was published by the Friends World Conference. Our peace, and just think of what 1952 was like, post Second World War, Korea, uh, building the walls was happening, wasn't it? No, it was happening later. I kept reading. Anyway, the division. Our peace testimony is much more than our special attitude to world affairs. 
It expresses our vision of the whole Christian way of life, or Buddhist, or Islamic. It is our way of living in this world, of looking at this world, and of changing this world. Only when the seeds of war, pride, prestige, and lust for power and possessions have been purged from our personal and corporate ways of living, only when we can meet all men as friends in a spirit of sharing and caring can we call upon others to tread the same path. Now for me, this testimony of 1952 does give me, and I hope you, a recipe for living by purging pride, prestige, lust for power and possessions. Uh, from our personal behaviours, we can work for change. And again, the yearly meeting statement in New Zealand said, we must relinquish the desire to own other people, to have power over them, to force our views on them. I may be doing a bit of that tonight. We must own up to our own negative side and not look for scapegoats to blame, punish or exclude. This, is, this speaks so much to today, this, this, these words. We must resist the urge towards waste and the accumulation of possessions. So how we work together for peace and justice will help us meet our goals. So my third th thread I've condensed to, to work for change effectively, we must walk the talk. Having been a politician, there is nothing that is so exasperating than, than to ask other people to do what you won't do. <laughs> so those are the three values. Now let's apply them. And I want to apply them to five levels. And I put a pen over here. The first one is a personal level. The next one is a familial family. The next one is community and or workplace, sorry for my blackboard writing, it has deteriorated, then on the national scene, and then on the international scene. God, that is dreadful writing. <laughs> I've been out of a classroom for too long. Actually, I did end up being a head teacher in England. It was, that's another whole night of about 10 hours. <coughs> So, if we take the personal, I'm going to take those three threads. Remember, each person to precious, to damage and destroy, to challenge evil, to build peace, you must connect within the goodness. To work for change effectively, we have to walk the talk and try and apply those to things. And I'll use me on the personal level. Connecting with the goodness within each human being, which is thread two, has often been a challenge in political work especially in our adversarial style of political argument. Which, by the way, is just ridiculous. I thought so then, and I still think so. So we have to work quite hard to change that. And walking the talk often throws up many challenges. Um, both, well, the grandchild that exists and the one that's coming early October are in California, so I do lot, spend a lot of carbon credits going across, flying across to see them. I have to deviate. The first one is called Araha. She's just started school. Asked by her parents, who are wonderful liberal people, those of you who remember Josh, I think he was called Danny, he changed his name to Josh. Um, he asked her the other day, how was school? And she said, that's my business. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's a chip of the old block coming through. And good luck to them. Anyway, um, life choices are really so clear and simple. My parliamentary experience was that awkward and constant compromise of clashing values. You had the overall team value of a better society, a just world, all those sorts of things. But in the middle, you'd have to be loyal to something you didn't actually agree with because you were trying to be loyal to the main thing. Foreshore and Seabed was one of those. That caused me all sorts of grief. And that clash is replicated in so many workplaces. I can remember my father, who worked here on the press in, in Christchurch. It was 51. He was reporting on the um, waterfront strike. Uh, he was reporting, in particular, on the stories of the, how the community was supporting the families of those who were on strike. 
He was called in by the editor and told he would lose his job if he continued to offer such stories. And at that time, of course, reporting on the community was illegal. And he had to make a decision. Did he do something of principle to get the truth out there, or did he, just after the Depression and the Second World War, uh, go without a job and a family without an income? We didn't have much of an income. So, and he chose, in the end, to keep his job and support his family. But making such a choice between family and community, and family and values, or whatever and values, is very difficult, and is one that's faced often. The family, the familial level. As I write, fresh from, and I wrote this in uh, January, fresh from family gatherings, dear God, <laughs> I kept on remembering my father's word, which I had to love my siblings even if I didn't agree with them. <laughs> uh, so that was thread too, was of particular importance there, didn't seem to work. But while I sort of grin about that, um, we are faced in New Zealand with family violence of an extraordinary level, and which is something that we need to work through. And the violence is not always verbal violence or argument, but it's physical. Then there's a community in the workplace. Probably the most important community in my life was my teaching community, in particular the schools at which I worked at. And as principal at Avonside Girls, I needed to harness the collective strength of the staff, teaching and support staff. And I could only do this by respecting their input into how students learnt effectively. Threads two and three really played a role here. We had to build a mechanism that was known as shared decision making, by which we were each able to contribute to decisions on staffing, on timetables, on budget, on workloads. They were pretty important decisions at the baseline ones for any big school. As principal, true, I did have the ultimate responsibility, but that did not mean that I should have the power to do as I alone thought best. That whole experiment, which was conducted in 10 secondary schools in New Zealand, uh, was followed through by psychologists. Avonside girls took a massive leap upwards in attainment and also in progress for the students because the staff owned the situation. The collective owned it. You know, it, there were some fabulous arguments. I won't take them all through, but there were some crackers. Again, in the yearly meeting peace statement, conflicts are inevitable and must not be repressed or ignored, but worked through painfully and carefully. We must develop the skills of being sensitive to oppression and grievances, sharing power and decision making, creating consensus, and making reparation. So you'll be thinking those lines in New Zealand. Unfortunately today, within New Zealand, we appear to value the strong leader. Okay? <laughs> Helen, strong leader. All those, those we, we value it, I almost think obscenely. And we pass over the decision making to them. The, the ability, and someone who forces their ideas and values and viewpoints on colleagues who are not encouraged to challenge. Whereas the ability to build an effective team always frees up ideas and energy. Currently, it's really interesting, we value clever leadership, inclusive leadership, in our sports captains. You make a film about it. I haven't been to it yet. Don't know whether I will. But this is about that sort of thing. And yet we expect our political leaders to be forceful. It's really weird. And I think we need to think about it. On the national level, there is so much we need to do as New Zealand citizens to apply these three threads. If we really believe that each New Zealander is too precious to destroy, then we would struggle against the tide of inequality, the tide that condemns children to poor health and low educational attainment, which is what Brian Bruce took us through last year. Our mainstream media would turn from celebrity focus to a focus on communities successfully making a positive difference and demonstrate how it's possible to connect with the goodness in everyone. Use that language 
Our prisons will be places of hope, not despair. The programs for change would be the emphasis, not just about keeping communities safe by throwing away the key. And as a nation, we would walk the talk. We would not be using shonky international credits to avoid making the changes to reduce our carbon and methane emissions. When a country sends soldiers to fight, they are implicitly saying that some lives are worth more than others. But even more importantly, the country is rejecting the more difficult path of finding goodness in the enemy, and through that, building a pathway to peace. Um, we would have more impact on world peace by using our waning diplomatic credit to build the bridges which will defeat evil, to focus on that second threat. During our time on the Security Council, we do have the opportunity to build different paths to peace through negotiation and contact. And as for threat three, in terms of the national, I fear we devalue our language. And I wrote this at the beginning of the year, before the recent water crisis. For years, we have damaged our environment while boasting of being 100% pure. If they took verbatim uh, um, minutes of Cabinet, you would find an argument I had with the Minister of Tourism that I was constantly embarrassed by that because I knew it to be untrue. We rest on the laurels of being nuclear free and yet have lost the national energy for peacemaking. There is so much to do at the national level to build a resilient society that has the credibility to challenge evil and to build peace. On the international level, and I have trouble with the words national and international as I get older, because so many nations are the creations of other people, regardless of the people who live there. And within the world today, there are far more uh, credible groups in the NGOs. But I'll, I'll stay with them for the purpose of this. On the international stage, there's little evident respect for value of individual life. New weapons, and delivery systems are being built all the time. Think of drones, think of the robots, and there's this awful term collateral damage which dehumanises the unintended victims of bombings or other weapons. Now here's where I'm going to just take you on thing. There has been a shift though. There are awful things happening in the world. But let me tell you that out of poverty 130 million people have been shifted out of poverty in the world. Globally, child mortality rates fell from 103 deaths per thousand live births to 88. There have been a number of UK, um, the UN Millennium Goals that have been met, the ones that were set in 2000. The progress is far from uniform. Now why I say that is, is that sometimes we can drown in the magnitude of the task. And I want to say there is hope. As humans, we do work together. We can sometimes achieve things. At intergovernment level, there does not appear to be much work being done to find the connections on which to build peace, although we have seen some recent excellent work uh, with Iran. There's also the whole thing about building trust in a process, as it has been with the Iranian uh, declaration. But rarely are these discussed and disseminated through mainstream media. It's the work of Professor Kevin Clements and Otago's School of Peace and Conflict Studies that are spreading the information and improving the practice worldwide. Those of you who know Kevin know he's hardly ever at home. And Richard Jackson, the other prof, is currently overseas as well at the moment. But when you go in, I don't know whether many of you have ever been in there, there are about, I think, 30 doctoral students in there. There are no undergraduates, but there are 30, and they come from all around the world. And so you can imagine the discussions that occur as people explore the perceptions they have of each other and each other's society. We need to get these success stories to the front of news and comment. 
it's, it's really hugely important. Okay, I'm moving away from those five things as they apply to the three threads into a wee bit about dispute resolution and um, disarmament. Because it would be a static society with no growth or improvement if we didn't have argument. But sometimes those arguments and disputes need to be resolved and not just by a greater might or a greater power. So as a society, we've built systems to resolve disputes. And instead of reaching for a bigger weapon or a longer punishment, it would be helpful in rebuilding our society if we used, expanded and improved our dispute resolution systems. Our courts in New Zealand have varying success with this. Mostly it's the power of the state that acts as a temporary resolution by punishing the guilty party, particularly in criminal offences. The legal mechanism for arguing the case before a judge or a jury focuses on the adversarial method, in which sometimes the truth is lost, or, imbalance, or an imbalance of power results in an injustice. And I was driving today, and I, or was it yesterday, I heard that whole discussion of legal aid, which adds to the injustice. In civil law disputes and within family law, there's much more use of mediation, again, with varying positive results. I was involved um, in the last year in a local voluntary community dispute, dispute group called Dunedin Community Mediation, and we pinched it from Christchurch. Okay? We've been in existence for over a year. We've averaged about a resolution a month. Uh, by the way, I am never ever a mediator. I was always a dog's body setting up the meetings. Because the first mediation they made me sit through, I wanted to hit one of them. <laughs> so I haven't got those skills. I recognise this, so I'll just stick to organising the hall. Um, resolving them involves building a trust in the mechanism and having skilled mediators with the ability to listen, to reflect, and finally to step back so that the people involved start fixing it up themselves. Okay? I would love to see such voluntary services spread throughout New Zealand. Because I, I, we've just done an enormous one that's taken over seven meetings and was on a pony club. But it was a pony club that had divided a whole community of parents. And it seems ridiculous, doesn't it? But it was very real. There's the um, environment courts, and I had a real battle there between the adversarial method in there and the inquisitorial method. And the only time I managed to get a law change to get the inquisitorial method in, the power company pulled out. <laughs> that was a white tacky. I have a sweet, small, small wee victory there. The international courts come in many different shapes, and the most senior of those is the International Court of Justice. And of course, it was July 1996 that I got that date right, I can't see you, Kate. Yes. Thank you. Um, on the legality of the threat or, or use of nuclear weapons. And then there are international forums, and there were two that have affected us. One was Ramsey, Regional Assistance Mission to the Solomon Islands. It had some terrible mistakes in it, but it also had some good things. Um, perhaps a major international forum is the United Nations and its specialised agencies. And I had real trouble with those. I've been lucky. I've addressed the Security Council. I've addressed the General Assembly several times. But I felt like a stuffed bag that I was saying words that I had to say. Only once or twice did I really deviate. Oh, sometimes you begin the words with a mihi in Māori and the poor old UN translators <laughs> go absolutely bananas. <coughs> it's good fun. But anyway, but this, it's very re real because it's like a courtly dance and it seems so remote from real life. So now we come to disarmament and we weapons control. As we know from history, disputes aren't always resolved through courts or mediation. <coughs> so alongside the movement for conflict resolution, there has been the movement for disarmament and arms control. Under disarmament, there's a whole debate on domestic gun control in any country. And while this is very important to building a peaceful society, I'm not going to examine those issues tonight, except to know that the Australians 
are ahead of us by a long chalk on that. Until 2012, recently, New Zealand dedicated a separate portfolio for a Minister of Disarmament and Arms Control. By the way, that doesn't mean that that one minister had that as their only job. <coughs> they normally had about 10 others. But they had a minister. This was consistent with the Act. What this meant was that there was a dedicated and reasonably resourced team within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who reported directly to the Minister for Disarmament. Um, on, on an agreed program of promoting disarmament in many of the international forums. <coughs> As well, there was a public advisory committee, PACDAC, and there have been people in this room who have been on it. In my time, this committee was used to discuss priorities for action at home and abroad on disarmament, and had some money. And so we had the work of Katie, where New Zealand played a significant role in disarmament education sponsored by the United Nations. We also had David Capey's work that we, we paid for, which was on small arms control in the Pacific. There is no minister, separate minister for disarmament now. There is one member of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs only with a brief on disarmament. They haven't a hope of covering Geneva, New York, and all the different places where we are involved. So there's an action point, by the way, people, and I've got some action points written out of there, which is to lobby for that. Then there's a question of sales of small arms to states, as in the Pacific, where people can't afford the customs and police infrastructure to enforce gun control laws, including imports. And without such community policing, guns become the easy tool of influence, power, and violence. And we've seen that in the Solomons. So there's a continuing role for NZAID or its equivalent. We do have a defence industry in New Zealand. I never thought that we did until I became the Minister. Not for defence. From memory, one of the roles of the Minister for Disarmament was to determine the appropriateness of exports of weapon systems to other countries. Now I have a memory of banning the exports to Israel of an electronic harness which would have helped sharpshooters improve their accuracy. Um, while this, um, we banned it, I banned it. I didn't even have to go to cabinet about it, I just had to advise them I've done it. I've never had so much power in all my life. <laughs> while this banning does sound principled, what then happened, the New Zealand company concerned was subsequently bought out by an American company and the manufacture and export was continued from there. So sometimes it does feel as though you're butting your head against the world of world powers as a very small and insignificant player. But citizen power can achieve change, and we've seen two. One is the Ottawa Convention on Landmines. I'm not going to give the whole name to that. That coalition was formed in 1992, and it was six NGOs that got together. And they finally persuaded the Canadians to adopt it and take it through its process. That was citizen-led. It wasn't led by ministers or civil servants. And we're seeing that again with uh, the United, United, United Nations Convention on Cluster Munitions. And one of the leaders of that campaign was a New Zealand woman, Mary Wareham. So we come to weapons of mass destruction. The motivation for opposition to weapons of mass destruction was probably the appalling incidents of the Second World War. You know, the number of times I hear things on the radio and I want to reply. There was something today when someone said, how can you distinguish between a gun and a cluster bomb? Quite easily. And it's this. When civilians were collateral damage, okay, the target of a psychological warfare to destroy the spirit of a civilian population. So we had the bombing of London, Coventry, the firebombing of Dresden, of Tokyo, and the final dropping of nuclear weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's the difference, because people who have absolutely nothing to do with the issue are wiped out. That's why it's called mass destruction. There are three groupings of mass destruction, nuclear, chemical, and biological. I'm just going to focus on the nuclear ones. Yearly meeting statement. 
Above and beyond all this is the insane stockpiling of nuclear weapons which could in a matter of hours destroy everyone and everything that we value on our planet. So there have been strenuous efforts to ban or limit nuclear weapons, public campaigns such as CND, treaties such as the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, the agreed limitation of nuclear weapons, the ban on the testing of nuclear weapons, nuclear weapon-free zones. Uh, the campaigns, CND was launched in Easter 1958, in the early years of the Cold War. People in England and in Europe were really scared of nuclear annihilation. And many people then wanted to see unilateral disarmament. How different the language in British politics is now. And thank God for Jeremy Corbyn. Okay. It was pretty nice. Oh, no, no, I won't do that. <laughs> Treaties. The spread of nuclear weapons continued until 1968. Up until then, America, Russia, UK, France, and China built more and more nuclear weapons and tested them. 1968 saw the Treaty on the Non Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, the NPT, being opened for signing after 10 years of negotiation. That's when it sounds remote. Okay. Of the 11 articles in this treaty, the first three articles are concerned with halting the spread of nuclear weapons. So those who had them couldn't help their allies to develop their own, and those who didn't have them couldn't develop them. And there was an inspection agency. And that's why the whole Iranian thing's gone on. The fourth article was a guarantee that all countries had the right to develop nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. And that's about how much you process the uranium. The treaty, though, has a balance which has never been observed. Those that do not have nuclear weapons agree not to acquire them. And those that have them agree they will negotiate to disarm. It's called Article 6. It says, each of the parties to the treaty undertakes to pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to the cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date, it's 1968, and to nuclear disarmament, and on a treaty on general and complete disarmament under strict and effective international control. whoop de doo It's absolutely brilliant. The floor is obvious, there was no date. And there was no system of verification. Until 1968, though, here I am being Polly Anna, there had never been any agreement to consider disarmament. So the MPT is rather special. And not only that, a total of 190 parties have joined that treaty, including five of the nuclear weapon states. More countries have ratified the NPT than any other treaty. There are some notable absentees. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea, India, Pakistan, and Israel. Now the interesting thing when I, when I list those four together is to think how differently each of those is treated by the powers that be. Agreed limitation of weapons. Now I'm going to do something rather difficult here and I think it's quite important because Trump doesn't understand it. And I would like at least you to understand it. Without verification, it's difficult to find accurate facts on how many nuclear weapons actually exist. In 1987, it was estimated that there were 62,000 nuclear weapons in the world. Today, that number is believed to be less than 20,000. So that sounds positive, but we can't verify it. And I need to explain how the eight nuclear states are so far away from meeting their obligation in Article 6. Yes, treaties have been signed between USA and Russia that set limits on the deployment of strategic nuclear weapons. Now, these were the nuclear weapons, and tell me if I'm right, dear man over there, that were stationed in one place and aimed at over there. Okay? They didn't move around. 
So people knew where they were aimed and knew where they were. Okay? They're not much use, really. These were the nuclear weapons that are essentially long range and aimed at targets continents away. And they have done set limits on those, but they have set no limits on the numerous non strategic or tactical nuclear weapons. These are shorter in range, they're delivered by planes, by ships, by submarines, and maybe one day by those things that were around up above you, whatever they call them, drones. The planes and nuclear weapons are stored in a range of countries throughout the world, the nuclear umbrella. So countries which don't have nuclear weapons host the weapons and the matching delivery mechanisms of the five nuclear powers. That's what makes it so hard. It is that nuclear umbrella that New Zealand opted to stay unsheltered by. This was such a strong stand. Don't let's ever forget it. And it's always made me proud to be a citizen who was led by people such as Norm Kirk and David Longy. But they wouldn't have done that if there hadn't been a huge, powerful citizenry behind it. But we said, no, we don't want to be part of that. I used to get absolutely ripped by the Australians. There may well be fewer weapons, but they're being modernised at great cost. President Obama is currently seeking to have $3 trillion spent on modernising weapons and methods of delivery. And this is the man who was given the, nuclear, you know, the, the Peace Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize. The revamp includes a request to buy 12 new missile submarines, 100 new bombers, and 400 land-based missiles. The White House will argue that that's because Russia is rearming. And it may well be true, or well, it is true. true. And then we have the, the debate about Trident Renewal Program in England. That's going to be really interesting after post-Brexit, because they have no money. The cost of building four new submarines has risen from 20 billion to 31 billion with an extra 10 billion contingency. I was head of a school, I wouldn't have minded some of that money. <laughs> the beacon of hope in that, of course, has been the Scottish National Party, and I love them dearly. I was often invited up to speak, and they really understood about working at community level. And of course, they don't want to have a bar of Trident. Now, the problem is that neither does Portsmouth in the south or any of those other towns along there because they've got a whole lot of communities living around them. And they do have memories of the Second World War and what it meant for the communities to be threatened. So they don't want them either. It was very really handy to have it in Scotland. Then there was a ban on testing nuclear weapons. I'll uh, just quickly go over that to just say there has also been a limitation on the testing of these weapons. Why? Because they were tested in Nevada, in the Pacific, in North Africa, parts of Australia. They were never tested in the counties of England, you know, or the eastern seaboard of the United States, or parts of France. Okay? They were always tested in someone else's territory. And in Russia, they were tested in the, um, the, the stands. I'll come back to them in a minute. There have been attempts to limit the testing of nuclear weapons. The other weapon we've used, or the other struggle, is the nuclear weapon-free zones. The other positive activities have been the setting up of these. They've been set up by the following treaties. I have to say this because I'm, I'm so proud of this. I was trained by good diplomats. One of them was your daughter. The Treaty of Kwataloko. The Treaty of Rarotonga, the Treaty of Bangkok, the Treaty of Pelandaba, the Treaty on a Nuclear Weapon-Free Zone in Central Asia, and Mongolia, stuck between Russia and China, has declared itself a nuclear weapon-free status. How about that for bravery? <coughs> and one of the interesting one of those was about Pelandaba, because a young guy in Wellington came to me, a young student, and said, I've got some time and an inclination because we need to get that agreed to. Now you, you sign up, I've forgotten the words now, the terminology, but you sign up, then you have to have it go through Parliament, whatever treaty. And it hadn't gone through these, all these Parliaments in East Africa. And he went through. And what he found was, and what I know from Parliament, 
There's two things in short to supply, time to pass legislation and money. And they didn't have time. They had much more legislation of importance to them to get through. And so they put these ones off on the side. And he managed to persuade them, simple ways, to get it through the House. And that treaty came into action. And why that was important was because the Southern Hemisphere was nuclear weapon free. <coughs> the Treaty of Central Asia was a clear rejection of this warfare from countries where nuclear tests had been carried out. Five new states agreed a treaty to declare themselves free of new nuclear weapons. <laughs> Kazakhstan, how do I say that word? <coughs> Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. At least three of those countries had nuclear test explosions on their territories. <coughs> the people and environment of Kazakhstan have been irrevocably damaged by nuclear weapons tests. Now remember, I argued at the beginning that one reason for New Zealand fiercely retaining its nuclear weapon-free statement was that this was discussed and argued in big and small towns across the nation. We used to grin at signs that said this school or small town was nuclear free. But what was being expressed was the conviction of the locals, not just of government at national level. Although today I worry that a new generation, not faced by tests in the Pacific, sees nuclear war as a remote possibility, more remote than the certainty of climate change. So, coming to an end, today in, 19, in 2016, <laughs> Where are we on our journey to a world of peace? We still have weapons of mass destruction and we can deliver them in much cleverer ways than ever before. There are fewer strate strategic nuclear weapons, but there are far more effective technical nuclear weapons that are more mobile. We know that we do not have the capacity to address in an adequate manner the immediate humanitarian emergency or long-term consequences caused by a nuclear detonation in a populated area. The mechanism, mechanisms such as the NPT Review Conference and the Conference of Disarmament are in stalemate and seem unable to achieve consensus to build an agreed process to achieve nuclear disarmament. Cluster munitions are prohibited the convention entered into force in 2010, but the convention hasn't been signed by Syria or Saudi Arabia, and both those governments have been suspected of using them in the last three years. And then there's a campaign on depleted uranium. Peter Lowe worked very hard on this issue. And as minister, I could never find any proof that the depleted uranium was a cause of so many health problems in Iraq. I should have done some more of my own reading, because now as I read I, up on the problem, I see that those disbelieving of the problems caused by the use of depleted uranium are those whose weapons used it for greater penetration. The Guardian reported in January 2016 that arms sales from the United Kingdom have not been subject to independent scrutiny for more than nine months. The, its chair retired of the committee. Amnesty International say more than 100 licences for arms exports to Saudi Arabia have been issued since bombing in Yemen began in March 2015, with a value to Britain of 1.75 billion. The export of arms has now reached the highest figure since the end of the Cold War. The largest exporter is the United States, followed by Russia, France, Germany, and the UK. And these are legitimate sales of conventional arms. They exclude all those arms found in, a, in abandoned garrisons around the battlefields of the world. Of note is a large amount of uncontrolled arms in Iraq following the invasion in 2003. And I think you can say the same for, I'm forgetting it, it's another North African Syria and across another one, Libya. <coughs> Libya, thank you, Dean. The last piece of bad news has been the growth of autonomous weapons such as drones and robots. And range against those is a group of academics and activists who have joined together in the campaign to stop killer robots. So what's the upside? Okay, as New Zealanders, 
We have a strong history of peace building. Perhaps one of the first were the people of Parihaka and their non-violent resistance to the wrongful attack on their land and their power. Archibald Baxter and his fellow pacifists are now well known for their courageous stand against fighting in World War I, especially with the film Field Punishment No. 1. But there are many whose work for peace has been forgotten. In 1909, the Defence Act was passed by the New Zealand Parliament. It introduced compulsory military training for boys between 12 and 30. Now, I always knew that boys didn't grow up. <laughs> That's the legislation that says boys between the ages of 12 and 30. It was opposed by the Religious Society of Friends and the New Zealand Freedom League and the National Peace Council. And Ada Wells is a familiar name from these struggles. One of New Zealand's most enduring peace groups is the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, founded in 1916. By the end of the Second World War, 800 men were held in camps as conscientious objectors. Speaking or writing for peace was banned. So speakers for pacifism were banned and faced three-month prison sentences with hard labour. Connie Jones was one of those arrested, as was Orman Burton. Conscientious objectors were still subject to a loss of civil rights. They could not vote, and they were denied certain jobs, too, um, right through into the 1960s. After the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, many realised that with these new weapons, all could be affected by war. Now listen to this, people. Amongst the first to formulate a protest against nuclear weapons were the Quakers. In 1957, they knocked on 10,000 doors in Auckland with their petition. Three quarters of those they approached signed the petition. That was fabulous work. That's as good a work, I think, as the women on the non-air tire bicycles who rode round here getting people to sign up to, for the vote, for women. This was when Elsie Locke became publicly involved in the peace movement and her support was Mary Woodward, an Auckland-based Quaker who died quite recently and who set up New Zealand CND. Elsie's children have also worked all their lives within the peace movement. Mary Ledbetter, Keith Locke. Owen Wilkes worked hard to persuade us about New Zealand's role in international spying. With Snowden's revelations on our role as a spy nation, linked to the USA and Five Eyes campaign, all that Owen Wilkes argues has been proven correct. And it was very early on as a backbencher that I was called into the boss's office and asked what I was doing down in Molesworth, not Molesworth, at the, um, yeah, and told to desist. And I did, unfortunately. I, yeah, never mind. Kevin Clements and Richard Jackson are two professors at Otago Centre. That's in Richard's recent book. Many, many of you read it, Confessions of a Terrorist? Oh, look, it's honestly worth getting and reading. It's fabulous. Think about that second thing about getting into the mind of someone else. That's what he does. It's brilliant. Two of today's contributors from New Zealand are Mary Wareham and Alan Weir. And when you add the work of Norman Kirk, Marilyn Waring, David Longy, Helen Clark, we have a legacy that is worth honouring by re-energising our work for peace. And we're not alone, because outside of New Zealand are the powerful voices of the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the people of Kazakhstan, 250,000 people in the areas where they did the tests. 10% of their population have major health problems related to that. The United States, we have the example of three peace activists who splashed blood on the walls of the bunker building. One of their numbers was Sister Megan Rice, age 85. So people, age is no excuse. <laughs> and I've raised the issue of small arms and also the issue of clearing the minefields. Fantastic work, and New Zealand Army has played a major role in that. And there's currently the, the work that's going on with the Marshall Islands case. So what can we do? Look back at those three threads and how we might apply them. Each person is too precious to damage or destroy. To challenge evil and to build peace, we must connect with the goodness within each human being. To work for change, we've got to walk the talk. I hope you've been made aware 
of some of the dangers around nuclear weapons that I've refocused, maybe brought up new things that you didn't know tonight in front of you. I didn't even talk to you about the loss of life and injuries sustained in the United States in their building of new forms of weaponry. If there is material new to, new to you, then we need to talk more about these issues in our communities. I get most of my information through Disarmament Digest, which is compiled by the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs. You can go on and get it. But we need to write letters or articles for our local papers. Working together in small groups increases one conf one's confidence and acts as a good copy editor. I was thinking of blogging, and I will, when things resolve inside my own family at the moment, at least once a week on various disarmament issues. We need to inform ourselves so as we can challenge the culture of fear and blame. Back in the days of being a Labour MP, we used to have messages about what we should introduce into summer barbecue conversations. <laughs> we need to do this too. If our forebears could go to jail because they stood up in downtown Wellington to speak about pacifism, then we shouldn't be too embarrassed or afraid to introduce these issues and topics at our dinner tables. And then there are some campaigns to launch or support. Where is New Zealand's voice on disarmament? Where is a minister for disarmament? We should have strong and a well-resourced team dedicated to disarmament. It used to be us in Sweden and Egypt, except for punctuation. Oh, this is sorry. But you just compare the numbers on disarmament with those on trade. Where are our New Zealand troops deployed? Now, the other day I was listening to a wonderful program, a podcast from BBC. Can't remember its name, but it revealed something that I remember. And I went down to Pete Hodgson and I said, do you remember this? The deployment of the SAS in both Britain and New Zealand does not go through cabinet. Totally undemocratic. It should. It's absolutely shocking. As I don't think ordinary people, you know, public, public, I mean, are we happy being part of Five Eyes? Can we develop support for a campaign on the killer robots? Can we support the Marshall Islands in its case to the International Court of Justice? Go and meet every New Zealand Member of Parliament. Ask them what do they think about these issues, whether they, what their stand is on nuclear disarmament, and ask if they're members of the Parliamentarians for Nuclear Disarmament. I think it's got another name, Non-Proliferation and Nuclear Disarmament. On the community level, I'd love to see community mediation available. And here's a simple, very personal one. Intervention against hate speech. When we read online com comments that are personal attacks rather than arguments, we should add our displeasure. Okay? We should actually intervene at, at, at the attacking the person. And if you want to just remind it of how important that is, in that terrible Brexit campaign, the death of Joe, that wonderful young MP. And really, it was in a culture that was just absolutely enhanced by the media of attack the person, don't argue the issue. We should hold local cottage meetings to discuss with our neighbours how we might build a peaceful community. So I hope tonight, darlings, that disarmament, I've left you with the feeling that disarmament is not some remote topic discussed by old lefties. It's something that we can act on in our daily lives at a range of levels. You don't have to appear before the UN. And I'd love you to reflect on that. I'd welcome any questions. It's a big goal, people, how we can join in action for peace at any level, personal, familial, communal, national or international. We want a world at peace a world disarmed. That is what they promised in 1968. If we all work at it every day, we will make it so. Thank you.